Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Thank you for tuning in to Lock and Talk Podcast, where you hear about NFL stars of tomorrow today. I'm your host, Barry Barnes, founder and CEO of LockerDashReport.com. And if you guys, anytime, go to the site, check the site out, look at the site, you'll see nothing but great content on the NFL that you will not see anywhere from around this big old blue thing. Yes, around this planet. I guarantee you, you will not hear or see anything in regards to the NFL like you were here on a Locker Talk podcast. And you guys can follow me on any one of my social handles on Twitter at Locker underscore reports. On Instagram, Lock Report 100, all small caps. On Facebook, LockReport.com. And also check out the podcast on Facebook. Now, listen. Okay, guys, I've been away. I celebrated 18 years with this beautiful woman right here. And I had definite family. So I was gone for a while. And the reason why I'm giving this look right now is because you guys still have not subscribed to the channel. Go to YouTube. Subscribe to the Lock of Talk podcast right now. I don't know what you guys are waiting for. I'm looking at y'all guys like... In the Matrix, hell. What's going on? Exactly. You heard LeBron. I don't know what the heck the Matrix world is. I ain't going to say the word that he said, but I don't know what's taking you guys so long. Subscribe to the podcast on YouTube, the Lock of Talk podcast. Now, like I said, been away. You know, I know you guys miss me. I know you guys probably miss myself. I know. I know you want to give me a hug. I understand. I understand. All right. All right. Touchy feely. Okay. Make sure you put your mask on. It's all right. It's okay. Miss y'all guys too. Now, we back, ready to get into some football stuff as we do here on the Lock and Talk podcast. Normally, I always talk about the guys from the NFL Regional Combine, which is what this platform is pretty much built on, but we still want to talk about the HBCU platform. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to dive right into that today because there are some things about the HBCU community that I do not like. And when it comes down to the game that I love with football and to see countless articles everyone is talking about the nfl not doing this and the nfl not doing that you know it tends to rub me the wrong way because hey i know what's going on behind the scenes and i know at the same time what the institutions and the hbcu platforms are not doing yes everybody want to point the finger they go point the finger i pointing blame on something but the part that I have an issue is with the HBCU community is that your guys are not being held accountable for the part that your guys are lacking in. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Yes, we want to make sure the HBCU presence in the NFL is a lot better. Now, over 1,700 players, a little bit over 1,800 right now because training camp is about to start, but a little over 1,800 players, only 38 players are from the HBCU community that's currently in the NFL right now. And they didn't get to make and break it down to the rosters of Big 53 yet. Now that's coming. But when you look at that on the outside, you have to probably say, man, the NFL doing a horrible job and not, you know, recruiting or looking at players from the HBCU um, platform. Uh, nope. It's not the NFL fault. You know who fault it is? Yep, you guessed it. I know you don't like to hear, but yes, the HBCU community, y'all guys play a major, major role. And we're going to get into it as to why there's only 38 current HBCU players in the NFL. So we're going to get right into it. I'm going to give this old good old breakdown. You know, I know that I'm not going to have a lot of friends after this, but who cares? <laughs> I don't do this for friends. I do this because it needs to get out and the truth needs to be out about the whole thing. And it's not too necessary to expose. Yes, we're going to expose some things, but it's also to be held accountable so that the HBCU community, when it turns to football, we're sticking with that sport, that they do everything on their part so that the NFL scouts will want to come and watch and look for their talent. Now, when we look at this, now, first of all, we have to understand the purpose for the HBCU platform. Now, when we think about, you know, about black history, about, you know, you know about brothers and sisters, you know, what this country had been through. And when it came down to education, yes, white America had the biggest schools, had the best schools. But of course, you know, African Americans felt as though, and we are, you know, we can compete on the elite level in the professional world. So when we look at the education, this is why the HBCU schools was actually put together to show that, yes, African Americans can compete against our brother and our white sisters, our white brothers in the same field. So that's why it was instituted, you know, to show that we can build off our own and be just as successful. And that's what the purpose for HBCU schools. Now, when you look back into like the 50s and probably in the 40s, even into the 60s, the NFL was not doing very well. It was actually on the decline because the NFL, frankly, did not have the good talent. And plus, at the same time, baseball was still the main sport. But they really didn't have the talent to actually sustain, you know, what it is today with all the, you know, highlights and what the players are doing in the field, which is great. 
You know, but those white guys back there, they, they couldn't carry the pill the way how they wanted to, to bring excitement, to bring fans to the stands. And so during that time, every, you know, you know, blacks was on one side of the table, whites was on the other side of the, um, the table. And segregation, you know, it'd be, that was the issue that America had. So when everything changed, when blacks was allowed to come to white schools, that's when we recognized that the black schools was the was the key essence of why these big white schools started to get better. Now, before segregation had ended, the NFL were going to the HBCU platforms to get the talent to help sustain the league, and they did. You know, all these great players from the HBCU schools helped carry the platform for the NFL. And so, when segregation ended, and when our brothers was able to go to these white schools, everything changed. White schools got bigger, got broader and bigger, bigger lights, and all of a sudden, big money started coming in, and they started doing well. And this is all of a sudden, you had your Bamblers and your Maryland's, your Ohio States, you know, your Michigan's. All these big blue blood schools started to take off with our brothers that's helping the elite brothers after that going to these schools and just taking it to a whole new level. When that happened, HBCU play started to dip, especially exiting the 70s and then into the 80s and to the 90s, to where we are right now. Whereas lack of a presence of the HBCU platform in the NFL now. This is where things start to get a little tricky. HBCUs, in a nutshell, are very profitable. And although the school was not built for athletic professionals, we really wanted to try to show and prove, and we did, that we as African Americans can compete on the professional level with our white brothers and our white sisters. Now, this was the part that did not change. They stayed, and still to this day, want to focus on academia. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. However, if you want to compete and still want to have our brothers and sisters to be able to comp uh, compete on a professional athletic level, we have to put into it. So, the pride of HBCU schools are not putting into their programs is a major, major problem. And yes, certain um, schools like Morgan State University, Grandin State University, anything in it with state, they get the funding from the state to the schools. Now, they get some money. It's not a lot of money. But however, it does not go to their athletics. That's the issue where it comes in at. And then when you have situations where we have our HBCU schools playing these big-time schools for us exhibition, college football don't have a preseason. So playing outside of conference, especially small schools, that's their exhibition game, so to speak. And the HBCU schools play a lot of these big-time players, um, schools, not to fill competition because there's no competition. They can't compete. But it's also for the big schools to get their, quote-unquote, preseason in, these exhibition in. So when it's time for conference play, these guys are rolling, rolling, rolling while our HBCU um, brothers are getting banged up. We had one young man that actually got paralyzed in 2015 going up against a big-time school. But anyway, we ain't talking about that. Because of the pride the HBCU community has and only want to focus on academia, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you want to cry foul and want to point fingers at the NFL, for not looking at the schools to get their talents to get to the NFL. You cannot blame the NFL because you guys not doing your part. Now, there are some issues that I have with the HBCU programs um, in regards to trying to get their players in front of scouts. They don't put money into their facilities. I mean, you look at some of these facilities and you look at the field and everything. It looks like something off a high school football team. That's crazy. And you want NFL scouts to come and look at your players. No. You have schools that's not putting into their facilities. A lot of schools not even feeding their players properly, not even giving them the proper nourishment that they need. At Morgan State University, I had this one lady talk to me a couple of weeks ago, and she talked about her son, how she had to rush home from work to make sure she prepared a meal for her son after football practice because the cafeteria was closed. And if the players were not finished practice, they would not be able to eat. They had to fend for themselves. And the mother wanted to make sure she got home to make sure that her son, who was playing with the Morgan State football team at the time, not going to say the name, but she said she had to rush home to prepare a meal for him because after practice, he wouldn't eat because the cafeteria would have been closed. We have HBCU schools having players working out in their dorm room. Look at this facility. Now, you know, I'm not going to say what school this is. You probably already know what school it is. But that practice, that facility there is no bigger than my living room and dining room and kitchen combined. It's really small. See how big these guys are? You have a Shaw universe. Look at this. These guys are outside working the ropes off the pole. And you see how it's split up? 
Now that's crazy. And you want to get the best out of your players? Now look at this facility here. Can't compete. This is like, oh, this, this is crazy how big this particular school weight room is. And we asked why our HBCU brothers cannot compete because you're not giving them the things they need to be able to develop their skill set to be able to play on the next level. Now you have some that will go out on their way on their own to try to get to the NFL and put a little bit more work in, but it's kind of tough when you go up against the obstacles of not having enough or not having it at all, and then you want these guys to be able to get a chance to get in the NFL. Now let me tell you something. If I was a scout, if I was an NFL scout, I would not come to an HBCU school. You want to know why? Because of this. Don't, no one look at it like this in the perspective of an NFL scout, especially area scouts. Now, all NFL teams have area scouts, and they have to work a certain area of schools where they get to. Now, some of them will be in the same community or the facility of HBCU schools. Now, if I was an area scout, and I keep going to my scouting director uh, and my personnel director and saying, hey, listen, you check this guy out, check this guy out, and then I keep trying to give him or her these players to look out for at HBCU and knowing that they're not good enough, I'm not going to have a job. My dream of becoming a coach or whatever I'm trying to get into the NFL will not happen because I keep bringing players that cannot compete on the highest level of football, so I'm not going to take a chance on the unknown knowing that y'all guys are not doing what you're supposed to do in order for these guys to get better so they can at least get in front of scouts. So that's your question. You want to know why scouts not come to HBCU schools? That is the reason why. These guys are not going to risk their career in trying to invest into unknown players when they know these unknown players cannot compete on the next level. So that's why you had these scouts all going to the majority, everybody on the same board with whatever one person says or another person says that should be the next big thing. You see them jump on that because with the majority, and if the majority is wrong, no one's going to lose a job. You know, everything is like, okay, we whiffed on that one. Okay, okay no problem. We're going to, you know, just dust that off and let's move into next year. But you want to bring in unknown players from small schools and HBCU schools. This is going to happen. These guys don't want to get fired. You know, so this is the reason why you do not see NFL scouts flooding HBCU programs. And that's, and that, and that's sad and that's a shame in its own. Now, another thing I know even personally when it's time to contact schools for players, and it just drives me crazy. I just want to bang my head off my own football. When we reach out to these um, coaches, they cannot get in contact. You know, they don't have the information of their players who you want to at least get some film or, or want to talk to or to reach out to them to see how we can actually get these guys involved and get them through the process. We don't even have the information. You have a lot of small schools. You know, that have it, you call them up and say, you want this player, no problem, this is his number, this is Twitter account, blah, blah, blah. There's no investigation there. You guys are not putting your players in the right position to be noticed, to at least get in front of scouts. Forget trying to get to the NFL. Your goal, especially from a small school, is to get in front of scouts. That's where it starts. When you get in front of scouts, that's when you guys will take it from there, and that's when you guys should start seeing after they get in front of those scouts, and then from there, they will have to do what they have to do in order to show their worthiness that they can be able to play on the next level. So this is one of the so so these are the things that we have to go through when we talk about HBCU players trying to get into the NFL. It's not the players. It's not the players' fault. It's the school's fault. Now let's say if you have an HBCU. I mean, let's say you have a, a high talent high school player that wanted to come and come out of high school and go to an HBCU school. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But let's say he was a five-star talent. He just wanted to break a, make a, a point, prove a point that, hey, I'm going to go to Bowie State. I'm going to go rock it out and still get to the NFL. Well, the chances of that is really, really tough because the competition level is not up to par where you need to be in order to develop, to get to the next level. When you have those stars that go, that decide to go to HBCU school or something had happened as far as SCTs or something with the family and they had to go to a school like that to try to live up to their dreams. And let's say that skill set is up here. Because the play in the HBCU football is not that good compared to the next level, Division ones where the big schools are, a player mentally not even realizing it, they will all of a sudden start to dip their skill set down, not going to work as hard because they feel as though that, you know what, I can dominate where I'm at now. 
I don't have to put too much work into this. And then by the time they get into their senior year and they're ready to get in the NFL and they're looking at their numbers, like, man, I had 150 tackles last year. You know, I had these many catches. I had all these many touchdowns. I threw these many yards. You know what? I'm ready to get to the NFL. I can make it. And they get in front of scouts. And then all of a sudden they start playing these upper echelon players from the big time schools. And, whoa. Yeah, yeah, you're looking just like that. Unfortunately, school sets you up to look stupid because you cannot compete with these guys that's coming from the Nebraskas of the world, the Wisconsin's of the world. You know, the big, you know, when you're Clemson's of the world. Can't compete because their skill set had dropped without them realizing that it dropped and it diminished over time because the competition play in HBCU football is not as good as it is to be able to at least, at least, get into an NFL training camp. That's where it all starts, folks. And this is the issue that we have with HBCU. So don't go pointing out saying the NFL is not doing all what they're supposed to do. It is the NFL fault. And y'all want to point numbers and point fingers and saying the NFL not doing what you want to do. We got to get to the point where HBCU schools do not use the monies that they are receiving when they play these games early on before their conference play start. You have the HBCU players playing against these upper echelon schools, getting their players hurt for the Mali dollar, and then the, the thousands of dollars they make it, they don't even put back into the facility. How can you develop your players if you're not invested into them? And when you don't invest into your players, you get what we got. 38 players out of over 1,800 in the NFL today. And it's not the league's fault. The league is putting things in place to make sure that the HBCU community is getting having the opportunity to get in front of the scouts. That's why we had the HBCU um, combine that's going to be powered by the NFL football operations next year. The NFL is doing their part to put these players in front of scouts. It's just up to you guys with the HBCU that have the money. I know you want to put it into your engineering program. You want to put it into your choir. Yeah, you want to focus on your band. All that stuff is cute. But if you're trying to get to the point where you want to be taken serious on a professional level in sports, you have to put into the players into that program. Because if you don't, you continue to get the results of averaging at least one HBCU player getting drafted each year. Averaging about at least nine players that will at least get a chance as un un free, undrafted free agents to get into a camp and then have about half of those guys that don't even make the roster or probably don't even last long on the roster to get to training camp. This is something that the HBCU community have to do, have to invest into their players, into their facilities. Yes, I know that you want to build a big buildings and you want to compete in that way, but stop crying foul, pointing fingers at the NFL as if they are to blame for the lack of a presence of the HBCU in the NFL. Now, we have some good players. You have your Darius Linus of the world. Yes, we know we have your Tommy Corns of the world. And I'm thinking he's, I'm, hopefully he's getting a lot better from turning his ACL next year. Last year, I'm looking forward to seeing what he's going to do in 2021. We have some talent that is there. The talent in the HBCU level is there? Yes, it is. But it continues to get diminished because the community, the schools are not putting into their programs. And they have to change. I believe y'all guys can do it. I know you guys can do it. Like I said, it's not the exposed. I mean, let's look at it. Look at this field. This is terrible. Tennessee State. Yeah, I was in Nashville. Come on, guys. You got to do better than that. Morgan State, this workout room. Come on, guys. Y'all yeah, got a nice – y'all building all kinds of stuff up and down Perrin Parkway. But come on, put something into this work room, y'all. Shaw University, Adrian Hill, I mean, Adrian Jones, Coach Adrian Jones, you're doing a fantastic job with those guys down there. I believe that Shaw University is going to do very well this year. And you clearly doing all you can to put into those players. But the coaches, their hands are tied, y'all. Their hands are tied. Stop making promises to these head coaches at the HBCU level, guys. If your administrators is going to say your coach is going to have an office, you're going to have a space, you're going to get this, you're going to cater to them, cater to them so they can put into these players so that players can be able to have a career on Sunday afternoon. afternoon. Thanks a lot for tuning in on this segment of the Lock and Talk podcast. We're here about NFL starts tomorrow today. I'm your host, your proud host, Barry Barnes, founder and CEO of LockedDashport.com. And like I said, guys, go to the site. I promise you, you will not see nothing like this nowhere around the world in regards to the NFL. I promise you. Follow me on any one of my social handles on Twitter at Locker underscore report. On Instagram, Lock Report 100. All small caps on Facebook, Lock Report. Dot, uh, LockReport.com. And also check out the Locker Talk podcast that's on Facebook as well. Now,
You, you know why I'm giving you this face. Come on, guys. This is some good stuff. Just do it. Do it. Exactly. What are you waiting Just for? Do subscribe it. today. Go on YouTube right now. Subscribe to Like a Talk Podcast because y'all guys need to stay on point because the NFL is about to, about to kick off. I don't want y'all guys to be behind because it's very important that y'all guys stay locked in with some unknown players. We'll come back soon. We'll talk about some good stuff. Everyone stay blessed. HBCU, get it together. Stop pointing fingers. Stop being so goddamn going profitable and put into these facilities. I'm out. Goodness gracious. Y'all guys driving me crazy. All right, goodbye.